may exert by the inhibition of specific epigenetic enzymes. It is also a DNMT specific inhibitor and does not impact any HDAC enzyme. Further mechanistic studies are recommended. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for your nice talk. And uh, let's get some questions. We have time. Attila, do you have any question? Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, Asha, thanks for the presentation. So uh, in, uh, in vitro studies have shown, I mean, in cell cultures have shown that uh, the compound shows some cytotoxicity. And then you have to uh, tr try to find out uh, what the possible mechanism of action is. Is that understand correctly? Did I understand that correctly? Yes, sir. Okay. But the problem is this. Um, you uh, rely on uh, score only, and I don't see any uh, validation. So can you comment on this? I mean, what is the reason that you uh, trust your molecular modeling studies? Uh, similar previous studies using other phytochemicals had been carried out at our laboratory also. And uh, there are in vitro studies also being carried out at our laboratory. Okay, but uh, I mean, is there a reason why you believe the scores and the poses that you have shown here? I mean, they are not really clearly visible, but Still, I mean, is there a reason that you trust that your molecular modeling procedure is able to produce the correct poses and the correct scores? Because I don't see anything about that uh, discussed in your method methodologies or in your results. So can you comment on that, please? Uh, yes, the molecular docking procedure had been used previously at a laboratory also. And... Um, Use in volume yeah, I understand that. That's possible, of course, but still you have to provide data here. I mean, do you, do you perform retrospective dockings, enrichments that uh, show that your methodology is reliable, other than that it is, has been performed earlier? Uh, yes, we did uh, compare it with, a no, with the already known inhibitors of galangin that are available. Okay. And we also regularly perform uh, studies that uh, we download the um, structure of the proteins, these proteins uh, with their inhibitors in which they are co-crystallized. And then we compare uh, to see whether we are getting the similar results as in the original structure. After removing it, we compare it to see whether we are getting the original. So we know that our results are reliable by using this docking procedure. OK. Thank you for your answer. Okay. Thank you, sir. Onur, do you have any question to Aisha? Uh, yes, uh, thanks okay. for this presentation. Uh, so you are docking a single compound to multiple enzyme structures. And uh, you try to explain mechanism of an in vitro observation. I think uh, regarding the presentation of uh, your results, uh, it would have been uh, much better if you showed uh, the active side of the enzyme, because in the results section, you claim that these compounds bind to uh, the active sites where the natural substrate binds. On the other hand, you use blind docking with Swiss stock. So Swiss stock may have uh, predicted a completely different binding site and if you uh, claim that there is a favorable interaction with the ligand on that binding site, it is not a definitive proof of inhibition or not inhibition, whether there is a lostery or not. There are a lot of issues that needs to be clarified before you can claim uh, a specific mechanism. Uh, we did not uh, claim the specific mechanism. We uh, did this study to check whether it, uh, the particular phytochemical galangin binds to the substrate binding cavity. So that is the cavity which is shown in blue. So we uh, created the hydrophobic surface of the cavity on the protein. Okay. Thanks. And then studied whether it is uh, the phytochemical is bound inside it. 
Uh, so we also carried out studies to compare whether uh, these bindings that we got were uh, comparable to phi as a DC, uh, a known inhibitor of DNMTs. And we found that most of the interacting amino acids were si similar as those which were involved in the interaction of um, phi as a DC and gelangin. Hence, we uh, said, we proposed that uh, the mechanism could be similar but further mechanistic studies are also required. Mm, all right, uh, but this uh, this claim of yours right now was not very clear on the poster. That's what I meant. If what you say is true, if you actually did it, you need to show it on the figures, and uh, you know it, it could have been a bit uh, better, a bit clearer. That was my uh, comment. Thank you. It was a uh, thank nice. you. Sir. So, uh, due to the limitation of uh, one page PDF uh, slide, uh, we could not focus, uh, we could not show uh, further results due to that limitation. I should, I have a just quick question for you. I'm also interested in uh, epigenetic uh, enzymes. I published several papers on different isoforms. So, have you tried glycanin? Uh, to H.6 and 10? Uh, not yet, sir. Not yet. Oh, I just wonder, is there any inhibition for that? OK, um, that was a wonderful okay. talk. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. We need to catch up time, OK? Let's go to the next poster presentation. Uh, next one. OK. Good evening to all my audience. Today I'm going to do a poster presentation on my research project with the title Isopinucafe as a potential lux quantum sensing inhibitor in LUPO fishery at TCC 77.4. So let me begin with my introduction. Quantum sensing is a bacterial communication system which regulates the gene expression and linked to diverse bacterial function such as virulent vector synthesis and also bioluminescence. So this has been regarded as a silver lining in the combat against the rising of bacteria antibiotic resistance. Isoprenial cafe is a potential large quantum sensing inhibitor because it was able to reduce the bioluminescence of aerobic fishery that controlled by the large quantum sensing mechanism by 88.5% at a minimum concentration of 15 micromolar. However, the molecular target of isopinyl cafe is still unknown, so we are going to use molecular docking as an early predictive assessment to investigate the molecular target and also the binding interaction of isopinyl cafe or the large protein which regulates the polymerase pathway of LUPL fishery. So the first step of molecular docking is to obtain the 3D conformal structure of the natural ligand and also the isopinyl cafe in the PubChem database. Then we are going to predict our LEPO fishery lux protein structure because it was not present in the PDB database. The protein model with less than 30% identity from switch model will be subjected to ITASER for protein trading on its own binding domain only to get the protein model. Then we can proceed to molecular docking and post docking analysis. So below are my results and also discussion. Isopinyl cafe actually show the highest binding affinity of negative 8.3 toward the lux AAB protein, which is a luciferase protein that catalyzes the bioluminescent reaction with the presence of reduced baby mononucleotide, oxygen, and also the aliphatic aldehyde. Docking actually revealed that the molecular target of isopinyl cafe is the flavor protein binding pocket on the luciferase, same binding site as its own natural ligand, the reduced baby mononucleotide. This suggests that isopinyl cafe exhibit is quantum sensing inhibitory effect, which lead to the reduction in bioluminescence by competing with the reduced baby mononucleotide or the flavor protein binding pocket on luciferase. So, in conclusion, the molecular target isopinyl cafe as a large quantum sensing inhibitor toward the LEBL fishery is deduced to be the flavor protein binding pocket on large AB protein, which is a luciferase. This early predictive assessment has established the basis for further gene expression study. So this is my acknowledgement and also the reference. With this, I end my presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'll take a few questions. We have time. Uh, shall we start with Attila? Sure, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, clear presentation, but uh, there's something I, uh, I also want to ask you what I asked you the previous one. 
the previous presenter. So uh, I might have missed this, but uh, did you do some uh, validation of your docking protocol? And are the results here on this uh, slide? Uh, yes, actually, uh, in, in our previous study from our research team, uh, also using the molecular docking to actually predict uh, what is the molecular target of the isopineal cafe on their quantum sensing mechanism. That one is from the chromobacterium uh, violation that produce a violation. So isopineal cafe actually also reduced the violation production that is controlled by the quantum sensing mechanism. So they also found that uh, isopineal cafe actually uh, bound to the the binding side of the wheel engine actually also bounded to the uh, is natural ligand is also a FAD binding pocket. So it's the same type as uh, as my result, uh, the flavor protein binding pocket. Okay. Uh, just another question. I mean, uh, you found that uh, this ligand, which I'm not going to pronounce now, but uh, competes with the cofactor, yeah? Yes. So uh, there might be another binding pocket there besides the cofactor binding site. Have you had a look at it? Uh, yes, actually, I study about uh, the seven protein that involve in the uh, lux quantum sensing mechanism. The as you can see on the poster is the AB is the luciferase, CDE is the, the fatty acid aldehyde uh, the reductase, and also the R and I is the regulatory protein. So. Uh, Based on this one, is actually I study the the important binding uh, residual in the pocket itself. So I only did the study uh, based on the important uh, residual that that is uh, catalyzing the uh, reaction. So uh, when I view the protein in the BioWare Discovery Studio, so I mainly actually aim for the site that is the important binding domain for this study now. Okay. And suppose that you don't have any in vitro data and you have just modeling tools available. How would you uh, show that the duct post that you have generated may be reliable and that it actually may show some affinity? If you don't have any in vitro assays, only computational methods, what methods would you choose? Uh, yes, uh, for that actually is the downstream process. Uh, unfortunately, I uh, for my master project is un only the fundamental study. So uh, because uh, actually the next step will be going to the protein study, uh, it will be using the X-ray crystallography or NMR method actually to frozen the whole protein structure to see whether the ligand and also the isopropyl. But if you just have theoretical methods, so Sorry? no X-ray, you don't have X-ray or NMR, just theoretical methods. Uh, what kind of computation would you do on these docked poses? What Sorry? is missing here, basically? So you have to, uh, done docked poses, yeah? Yes. Uh, so how would you better calculate the interaction between your ligand and your binding oh. pocket and whether your ligand, the pose that you suggest is stable? or yeah. likely, how would you investigate that purely by theoretical methods? If by the bioinformatic method, the next step will be suggested for the molecular dynamics to see uh, how actually the isopinia can interact with the uh, surrounding uh, binding residue. Okay, th thank you very much. Okay, is there any other comment or question? Honor, do you have any question? Uh, yes, I have. Um, okay, go ahead, please. I have one question. So this is a again a, a, a single compound, and you tested its uh, binding to multiple enzymes. And at the end, you show results for only one of them, which gives minus eight point three kilocalories per mole. Yeah, why do you show this one and not the others? Because uh, this one showed the highest binding affinity and it bounded to the important binding residual. So uh, I did not show the others because uh, the binding affinity is relatively lower as compared to this one. Okay, so at this point, I think uh, we can think uh, also in this way. Uh, first, uh, the binding affinity is, I think, worse than the natural ligand. So, uh, 
I mean, if natural ligand and this molecule are present at the same time in the environment, the enzyme will prefer the natural ligand and will not bind uh, isoprenyl caffeate. That would be the conclusion from these results. Of course, you need to do either in vitro studies or further much uh, detailed free energy calculations involving molecular dynamic simulations. Uh, but look at uh, the rest of your results. Uh, the natural ligands also show lower binding affinities for them as well. But in some cases, you detected a better binding affinity for your ligand. So for example, LUX-R. You see the natural ligand binds with minus 4.8. Uh, it doesn't really uh, mean that, uh, like you shouldn't really compare binding affinities uh, between different proteins. The binding affinity will be different uh, for every protein. I don't believe this is the right way to select the ligands. If you get minus 4.8 for a natural ligand, and if you actually know it is a natural ligand, so if you get a binding, a better binding affinity for the same protein, it may mean that your uh, molecule will be preferred instead of the natural ligand and will actually inhibit that enzyme and not the one you have chosen here. So there's the kind of, uh, you know, you need to rethink about this. Huh? I would have I would have chosen the other the other enzyme and the other uh, you know the results, not this one. So just don't only look at the uh, absolute value of the binding affinity. Okay, sure. Because I, I, it's actually I, after what you get after docking is not a specifically binding affinity. It's just the docking score, and you just use some correlation. Um, have you used autodocvina here? I think I've missed. Uh, yes, yeah. Yes, yes, Autodoc auto Vina actually computes a score and uh, it's uh, calculating binding affinity based on a, a experimental correlation published in 2009. It doesn't really mean that this is actually the, uh, the, the this is the actual binding affinity. There's a, I think the error range is plus minus two kilocalories per mole. This is quite high. And you should always keep this in mind when evaluating uh, such talking results. Thank you, okay. buddy. Uh, thank you, Master, uh, and you presented well. Thank you. Thank, thank you for the yeah, I think that Eric got all the important points, and work on that project. You know, in the coming you know years. Okay, thank you very much for your nice talk, yeah. Eric. Let's thank go you, to sir. the next talk. Next talk is going to be an oral, and it is the title is QSAR, Admet and Molecular Docking Studies of some novel xanthine derivatives for anti-pancreatic cancer, okay? Who is talking, Ahmed? Are you there? Uh, Bakar Siddiq, I'm here. Okay, Abu Bakar, okay. Go ahead, please. Uh, derivatives for antipancreatic cancer. Uh, this is the outline of our presentation. Introduction, aim, methods, results, conclusion. Introduction, one of the most challenging cancer treats is pancreatic cancer because its early detection uh, is extremely difficult and cannot be surgically removed to its location. Pancreatic cancer, pancreatic cancer uh, is currently one of the most leading causes of cancer death due to the fact that its symptoms is usually appears at an advanced stage and tend to spread throughout the body. The several insulin strategies have proved to be potential for filtering chemical data this towards the biological targets for the design of novel lead drugs. One of the major use of strategy, major use strategies uh, is ligand-based virtual screening, which has emerged as famous because of the of its potential to screen a huge range of uh, molecules passed from other available databases. The aim of this research is to develop a good PSAR model for predicting the activity 
of some selected compounds against the pancreatic cancer perform molecular protein studies to understand the nature uh, of interaction between some selected compounds and the ECFR receptors and examine the admit and drug likeness property. Uh, research method methodology, data collection, a series of uh, 23 and teens carrying telecomoity derivatives with the IC50 were retrieved from the literature of Abu Zaid et al. 2019. The inhibitory activity were linearized by taking the negative logarithm to the best 10. Uh, the, the compounds were skewed using chemical ultra 12 and transformed into 3D formats using Spartan protein software. Density functional and density functional theory quantum mechanical calculation was employed for the geometric optimization. Or the geometric optimization using B3 LYP uh, 600 and 1G star basis state. The optimum, the optimized structure were saved in PDF format and, export, and then exported to Bidel descriptor software to complete, to compute the molecular descriptors. Uh, the, the activities of individual compounds were inserted in the computed descriptors, descriptor file and seed for the development of uh, mod, uh, QSAR model. Uh, then the set file was then exported to DTC QSAR software, where genetic function algorithm D multilinear regression was utilized to develop the model. Uh, legal protein docking was performed to study the nature of interaction between active, active pockets of EGFR receptor and the four selected ligands on HP laptop equipped with uh, Edgigram using Autodoc Vina in Firex and Discovery Studio. Uh, using Swiss Admi, we use Lipinski rule of five as initial step for oral bioability. Uh, results. Uh, this slide or the table depicts the minimum criteria for generating a good USAR model and as a side as the values of each parameters for the generated model. This slide contains the correlation matrix mean effect and various inflation factor, various inflation factor for the uh, USAR model uh, model descriptors. The descriptor SP max one BHV with positive mean effect and lowest VIP was found to influence the generated model. Here is the binding affinity of some selected dogs compound with EGFR receptor with compound three and eight having the best binding affinity. Uh, the 3D and 2D binding pattern of compound two in the active side of the EGFR receptor is shown in this slide. Uh, from the slide, uh, from the slide, we can see that the compound two interacts uh, with the receptor using conventional hydrogen bondings, uh, carbon hydrogen bond, pi sigma, pi sulfur, pi pi T shape, alkyl and pi alkyl, and this also is the compounds compound three in the active site, interacting with the active site of the EDFR receptor through the conventional hydrogen bond, convention, uh, carbon hydrogen bond, halogen, pi sigma, pi sulfur, and pi alkyl. Uh, this is compound eight, interacting with the EDFR through co two conventional hydrogen bonding, uh, carbon hydrogen bonds, pi sigma, pi sulfur, pi pi T shape, MI pi stack and pi alkyl. And also this slide contains the reference drug in uh, interacting with the EGFR receptor. Uh, the compound 
which is chlorum busil uh, interacts with the receptor through phenyl and aligning uh, conventional hydrogen bonds and alkyl and pi alkyl, several pi alkyl interactions. Uh, this table depicts the uh, Lipinski rule uh, parameters for the Lipinski rule of five. Uh, the MW represents molecular weight, the NHBD represents number of hydrogen bond donor, NHBA number of hydrogen bond acceptors, W log B, then for the to topological polar surface area. Uh, uh, none of the four compounds violate greater than two of the acceptable thresholds established by the Lipinski rule of five. High predictive power given the descriptor SP max 7 BHD and SP max 1 BHD D pole and VR1 DZI. The validation parameters used to generate the model as discussed above also pass the minimum recommendation for building a valid PSAR model. Uh, descriptor SP max BHD is positive mean effect value of 1.1783 was found to mostly influence the optimum model. Uh, compound three and eight have beta binding affinity than the reference drug. None of the compounds violate greater than two of the acceptable thresholds established by the Lipinski rule of five. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you, Abu Bakar. Uh, it was a nice thank you. Talk. Let's get uh, any comment or question. I think Attila is having some problem with uh, his computer. Shall we start with Onur Bey? Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm here, I'm listening. Okay. Uh, thanks, thanks, thanks for this talk. Uh, I would like to ask again, I just, I think I missed which software did you use to, uh, for docking especially? For docking, I use a uh, 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 Autodoc Bina in Firex. Okay, have you have you validated the software? Uh, same question. The software. Yes, the Bina. Have you, have you checked its performance uh, for the target docking? Like yes. Docking calculation. Yes, I have done that. Okay then, uh, thanks. Thank okay. you. Let's thank Abu Bakar again, and let's go thank to the next talk. Next talk is uh, his poster presentation. And the title is the role of epigenetic remodeling in COVID-19 infection. Uh, I think there's uh, a question in the chat box. This one? There's a question in the chat box regarding the previous Previous talk. Let's see. Yeah, yeah. I think we answered all these. Yeah, yeah, he answered. Okay. okay. We can. We can. I checked. I, I, we, we answered. Okay. Now, shall we start the post presentation? Um, yes. Simran, are you the one who is presenting? Yes, sir. Okay. Go ahead, please. Hello everyone, I am Simran Preep Kaur, a graduate student at the Department of Microbiology, University of Delhi, India. Today, I'll be reviewing the interrelationship between host epigenetics and SARS-CoV-2 infection, replication, and pathogenesis. COVID-19 appears to be oddly selective, as only a small percentage of infected individuals become sick, and most of them are of old age or have an underlying medical condition like cardiovascular disease, hypertension, or diabetes. On the other hand, COVID-19 has been proven fatal for several previously healthy and even relatively young individuals. This variability can be explained only by the host genetic and epigenetic factors. Epigenetics is the study of molecular mechanisms that can perpetuate alternative gene activity states in the context of same DNA sequence. Moreover, it has been hypothesized that the epigenetic scars of the immune system 
obtained from the previous infections such as common cold coronaviruses or childhood infections may even alleviate the severity of COVID-19 infection. Viral infection releases PAMPs which are recognized by the TRRs and a cascade of reactions is set off as an innate immune response. The balance of voice promoters of the interferons and the tumor necrosis factors shifts towards activation, which stimulates the transcription of interferon-stimulated genes or ISGs, which are critical regulators of cytokine storm, a hallmark of COVID-19 infection. The epigenome-wide association studies within COVID-19 patients with a vast repertoire of clinical outcomes have revealed the augmentation of chemokine activity and other inflammatory pathways. The viral components thus reprogram the epigenome of the host cells. For example, the protein 3P is an accessory protein which phosphorylates the RUNX1B of the host cell and then activates the interleukin-2 promoters and thus the TC cells show an exaggerated immune response. Similarly, SAM-dependent methyltransferases form the 5' prime cap which protects the viral RNA from degradation and induces the process of translation. On the other hand, the viral NSP5 protein inhibits the transport of histone deacetylase 2 into the nucleus, thereby leaving an impact on the epigenome of the cell. We all know that the ACE2 receptor is essential for the viral entry into the host cell. In the first wave of infection, SARS-CoV-2 enters the host cell through ACE2 and releases its viral RNAs, which are sensed by TLR3 and other components. This leads to the activation of innate immune signaling pathways, resulting in the production of interferons and other inflammatory cytokines. Then ACE2 is upregulated by these cytokines through JAK-STAT pathway, hence enhancing the entry of SARS-CoV-2 into the host cell. Moreover, the transcriptomic data from COVID-19 has revealed an imbalance between ACE and ACE2 expression, which causes the increased production of bradykinin, a vasodilator. Further, ACE2 is naturally abundant in patients with hypertension, diabetes, and previous smoking history. These findings indicate the epigenetic control in the ACE2 expression and the impact of COVID-19. The global data indicates higher COVID-19 case fatality rates among men than in women. Females show increased immune activity as the ACE2 genes and a number of genes involved in the innate and adaptive immunity escape the X chromosome inactivation. Thus, in females, ACE2 is expressed in the heterozygous form, which prevents the binding of RBM of SARS-CoV-2. In comparison, the homodimers in males do not provide immunity. Thus, females benefit from the added physiological diversity when facing new immune challenges such as SARS-CoV-2 infection. However, the sex differential modality is not the same at every age and requires further investigation. Epi drugs are the chemical modifiers that can target the epigenetic enzyme inhibitors. A group of scientists have performed a comparative transcriptome analysis in COVID-19 infected patients, which revealed certain epi factors implicated in epigenetic response against SARS-CoV-2 infection. Another group of uh, scientists have repurposed an FDA-approved epi drug called valproic acid, which impairs the proliferation of SARS-CoV-2 virus particles in a dose-dependent manner without significantly affecting the host genomic and subgenomic mRNAs. Thereby, the use of MP drugs is an alternative but attractive approach. I will conclude this presentation by saying that SARS-CoV-2 has caused significant disruption in the worldwide social and economic elements, and the virus continues to mutate at an exponential rate. However, no clinically viable pharmacological or preventative therapy with proven effectiveness is available. Understanding the molecular and cellular mechanism of coronavirus infections, focusing on the epigenetic biomarkers is thereby essential for developing successful intervention techniques. Identification of epigenetic regulators will aid in predicting which healthy individual will develop a severe version of the disease and who will have no symptoms at all. Furthermore, epidrugs may be utilized as adjunct compounds with antiviral treatment can modulate the DNA methylation landscape. As a result, to improve the COVID-19 treatment regimen and manage the dreaded cytokine storm, we will need to assess the efficacy of novel and existing epidrugs. Thank you.
Thank you, Simran. It was a very nice talk and interesting. So I think the people benefit out of this for this deadly disease. Okay, now the talk is open to question and comments. Onur, would you like to add something? Uh, thank you. Uh, I don't have any questions. It was a good overview. Nice okay, time. yeah, okay. Okay, let's thank her again. And let's thank go you, to sir. the next oral presentation. It's my pleasure. I, okay, the next one is, um, is again oral presentation. In silico design of anti den v 2 ns 2 b and S3 peptide inhibitors. Okay. Uh, who is... Leon, are you the one? Lai Tai Leon. That is me. Am I pronouncing your name correctly? Yeah, Sorry right. about that. That's correct. Okay. Yeah. Okay, go ahead, please. A very good day to the judges and audience. Today, I'm going to present several designs of anti dengue virus type 2 and S2B and S3 peptide inhibitors. So, why dengue? Geographically, dengue is the most widespread upper viral disease caused by dengue virus with Aedes mosquitoes being directed. This single stranded positive sense enveloped RNA virus is classified under the genus Flavivirus and family Flavivirus. Due to the presence of four antigenically distinct serotypes, dengue vaccine's development has the risk of antibody-dependent enhancement, a phenomenon that enhances viral infections and replication by suboptimal antibodies. Due to climate change, the epidemicities of dengue spread rapidly from nine countries before 1970 to more than 100 countries currently, a phenomenon that enhances viral infections and replication by suboptimal antibodies. Due to climate change, the epidemicities of dengue spread rapidly from nine countries before 1970 to more than 100 countries currently. Annual infection was estimated to be 390 million, 96 million of whom have clinical manifestations of different severity. Dengue disproportionate least affects Asia with 70% of its total burden concentrated in this continent. From year 2000 to 2015, the reported dengue-related deaths increased from 960 to 4,032 in Malaysia. In fact, dengue was recently listed as one of the 20 neglected tropical disease NTD to be controlled in the WHO NTD roadmap 2021 to 2030. The dengue virus NS3 protein consists of two domains, which are the protease domain at the end terminus and the multifunctional domain of helicase nucleoside transphosphatase and 5 prime terminal RNA transphosphatase at the C terminus. It is the most conserved protein in all four serotypes of dengue virus, with the similarity of 77% in the amino acid sequences. Another protein, NS2B, is the cofactor of the dengue serum protease. Its association with the NS3 protease domain is essential for the proteolytic activity to be carried out at its full capacity. Due to the importance of proteolytic event in the life cycle of dengue virus, NS2B and NS3 is an important target for drug screening in search of antiviral against dengue. In flaviviruses viruses such as dengue virus, all the structures and non-structural proteins are translated continuously as polyprotein due to the presence of only a single open reading frame. For each viral protein to be functional, they must be separated from each other by proteolytic cleavage at the endoplasmic reticular membrane. This is performed by the host protease within the ER elements and dengue and S2B and S3 protease in the cytoplasm. These slides show the sequences of eight different sites cleaved by dengue and S2B and S3 protease. To differentiate the N and C termini, the cleavage sites are designated to be thrown to the non prime and prime site, respectively. In the figure here, the cleavage site is pointed by the arrow. These sequences were extracted for peptide inhibitors developed by mimicry. Conventional small molecule inhibitors are not effective against NS2B and NS3 active site because of its high charge and flatness surface. Hence, peptides were chosen to drug this protein. Since the linear peptide sequences are recognized as the substrates of dengue and NS2B and NS3 proteases, the peptide inhibitors were cyclized using sunflower trypsin inhibitors as FDI1 as a scalpel to prevent the degradation. And most all the prime and non-prime site residues are substituted with the amino acid residues found in the eight cleavage sites mentioned earlier using various mutants with different activities against dengue protease. The only exception is the conservation of P3 residues for all mutants because this resistant residues is significant in forming disulfide bridge for better peptide stability. 
as shown in the computational methodology, the pattern design began with the use of PDB, PDB redo, and also six version 6.0 for structures retrieval and validation. Build command of ESR was then used to model the missing residues of the crystal structures, followed by minimizations and quality check, including docking validation. After that, different variants of the six. After that, different variants or missions of the cyclic pattern generated in silico were docked with the Thank you, ICO type 2 and S2P and S3 using HEDOP, giving results that were visualized and analyzed using HEDOP and midpoint. Finally, toxin price and cell PPD were used to predict the toxicities and cell permeability of the, of the cyclic peptide. Now I will present the result and discussion. Due to the absence of core crystalline ligands in the crystal structures of the Dengue ICO type 2 and S2P and S3, 3U1J, the crystal structures of Dengue ICO type 3, protease bound to a protein was chosen for docking validation. This validation is important in order to ensure the validity of docking result. The RMSDs of C-alpha had a value of 0 0.741, over 222 aligned residues with 100% sequence identity, showing how to be good at protein pattern docking for Dengue and s 2 b and 3 This table shows the sequences of Wauchai SFTI1 and its different mutants. The mutants were named by adding the origins of mutant sequences after the phrase SFTI1. The comparisons of wild types and mutant SFTI1 shows SFTI1 can seem to be the most stable cyclic peptides after normalizations with the value of negative 813.516 kJ per mole, followed by SFTI1 and S3 int and SFTI1 4B5. On the other hand, SFTI1 and S3 int was shown to be the best beta inhibitors with the lowest value of negative 207.709 kJ per mole. This is followed by SFTI1 capsids and SFTI1 3 as the second and third best inhibitors, respectively. Using the DIMPLOT program of LIPOP Plus for 2D visualizations of interactions between 4M9K Dengue or SCL type 2 and s 2 b 3 and peptide inhibitors, it is obvious that the peptide metagenesis using natural sequences derived from polyprotein sclerate sites significantly increased the number of hydrogen bonds and hydrophobic interactions, similar to the wild SFTI1. The three best mutants inhibitors also form hydrogen bonds with aspartate 1075 of the ns 2 b and 3 indicating a concerted interaction that is essential for interactions of these cyclic peptides with the ns 2 b and 3 The best peptide inhibitors, SFTI1 and s 3 in is the only peptide that forms hydrogen bonds with all three residues of the catalytic triads on ns 2 b and 3 which are the histidine 1051, aspartate 1075, and histidine 1135. This may explain its strongest binding affinity towards Dengue virus type 2 and s 2 b and s 3 Based on this table, it can be observed that most mutants generated from the natural clearing sequences form more hydrogen bonds and non-bonded contacts with the NS2B and S3 than the wild type SFTI1. These align well with the assumptions that natural polyproteins substrates form favorable interactions with the NS2B and S3. Although the top three NS2B and S3 inhibitors neither have the highest number of hydrogen bonds nor the highest number of non-bonded contacts, a clear trend can be seen that all of them have six to seven hydrogen bonds with more than 16 non-bonded contacts. The formations of too many hydrogen bonds may indicate our polarity, so the peptides as shown by the poor cell permeability of SFGI1 and S4A in the coming slide. Although protein's analysis shows that SFGI1 and S4A has the largest number of hydrogen bonds, it is not the strongest minded of ns 2 b and S3, probably due to its unfavorable positive values of dissipation energy. This is supported by the et al. in 2017 that the binding of peptide inhibitors to ns 2 b and S3 at its active site is solely driven by entropy. Although the entropy is normally increases with lower dissolution energy, SFTR1 to A2B, which has the lowest dissolution energy, is not among the top binders of the NGR CH2 and S2B and S3. This indicates that the controls of entropy may be more complex than the involvement of dissolution. Linada also showed that the increasing hydrogen bonding is correlated with improved binding affinity. This may partially explain the relatively lower values of gas final energies after minimizations and held up binding energies of peptides with many hydrogen bonds, such as SFTI1 4B5, SFTI1 Cassid, SFTI1 2B3, and SFTI1 NS4A. In alignment with the previous status of having the lowest head of binding energies, SFTI1 NS3 int has also the lowest head of score and the lowest electrostatic energy, possibly improving its binding with the NS2B NS3 and tropically. Toxicity's predictions based on toxin Pratt shows that all SFTI1 variants to be non-toxic, except SFTI1 and S2A26 and SFTI1 and S2A A6. Toxicity is a major factor of failures in clinical trials. 
early predictions like this hence helps to focus the resources on promising accounts. Non-toxicities of peptides are also important to ensure their safety and prevent drug-induced adverse effects. Besides, it is important for antiviral peptides to be cell permeable so that they can reach the intracellular components where most target viral proteins are located. More than half of the SFTI1 mutants may not be able to exert the inhibitory activities due to inability to cross the plasma membrane based on the cell PPD prediction. The cell permeabilities of these SFTI1 mutants may be increased by incorporating non polar residues at non prime sites to offset the prime site polarity. In conclusion, research from molecular docking show that SFTI1 and SVIN, SFTI1 capsids, and SFTI1 34A to be the top three candidates that may be further optimized in the future for better pharmacological properties in terms of cell permeability, specificities, and affinities. This may be achieved by mutagenesis, incorporations of unnatural amino acids, and post translational modifications of amino acids. All peptides and inhibitors designed except those with MS2B clearance site sequence are non toxic. Molecular dynamic simulation is currently ongoing to investigate the binding of these peptide inhibitors with MS2B and MS3. Last but not least, I would like to thank my institutions, University of Patron Relations, and my supervisor, Dr. Adam, for the support, as well as the conference organizers, for the opportunity to give this talk. Here are my references. Thank you for listening, and I'm happy to answer your questions. Well, thank you very much for this uh, nice talk. Uh, is there any question for to Tai? Uh, uh, Attila, is, are you there? Are you ready to ask? Yeah, I'm here. Can you uh, hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you for the presentation. But it was very fast. He spoke very fast. Uh, maybe uh, you sped up the playing of the video. I don't know to fit inside the time, but it was very difficult to understand. So therefore, I'm going to ask you some questions. Uh, you had a picture showing a 2D, uh, uh, the, two, two, uh, the 2D structure of the ligand interacting with the protein active site, if I saw it correctly. Can you uh, show me that picture again? And sure, see, sure. can you discuss uh, the interactions that you see there? Maybe we ask Mohamed for help. Mohamed, you are in charge. Yes, I'm here. Just let me stop my screen first. Uh, would you mind allowing my another account, account to share the screen? It's under the same name. Yep, I've just done it. You can you can share your screen. Yeah, I see where now. Oh yeah, it's coming. It's coming up. Yes, uh, that's the one. Can you show that? Can you discuss the pictures? Because it's also not very clear. So basically, I uh, generated the 2D interactions using the dim plot functionalities of the Lipot Plus. And then I extracted the informations and then tabulated into this figure, uh, these tables. So based on this table, it is very, um, obvious that the number of interactions, both non-covalence and uh, hydrogen bonds, uh, it's uh, higher in amount compared to the wild height sunflower trypsin inhibitors. I see uh, the amino acids that I'm seeing here in 2D are of the peptides, right? Yeah. So basically... Uh, but um, they, they look so scattered over space. Is that the artifact of the program? I think so, yeah. What do you mean by scattered over place? Well, I just see the amino acids not really connected to each other. Oh, um, basically, in this program, they would just show the um, amino acid residues that are involved in the interactions with the protein. So if the protein's residues or the peptide residues is not involved in the protein peptide inhibitions, it will not okay. be Okay. Uh -huh. Okay. And in the next slide, uh, you show uh, the amount of hydrogen bonds formed per peptide. Yeah. 
yes. Uh, is that information really important or should be uh, should we be careful just looking at that one? So the amount of hydrogen bonds, can we rely upon that? Yeah, so basically I have referred to the papers of Professor Celia from California. So basically they did the docking analysis uh, of the cyclic appurtenance with the dengue virus stereotype two, uh, stereotype three protease, and then they an analyzed the uh, number of hydrogen bonds, but then they analyze it in terms of the number of hydrogen bond that exists in the uh, MD simulation. So currently my MD simulation is still running. So I just shows the hydrogen bonds uh, in terms of molecular docking. So basically, as we know, peptides, peptide protein interactions are similar to protein protein interactions. So between the different backbones, we can also form hydrogen bonds. So the, the larger the number of hydrogen, uh, hydrogen bonds, uh, the, the better the binding between the proteins and bind uh, and the peptides directly. Yeah. As you said, uh, we are interested in the number of hydrogen bonds during a simulation of considerable time. So uh, looking at the hydrogen bonds in just a docked post is not uh, good enough, basically, because the post you have generated uh, yeah. might not be stable during an MD or simulation. And, uh, starting with 10 hydrogen bonds, you may end up with only five. So looking at the numbers here uh, is less uh, significant compared to looking at the same numbers in a molecular dynamic simulation. Okay, that was it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Onur, do you have any question or comments? Uh, yes. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, the the presentation, uh, you talked a bit fast, it was a bit difficult to follow. Uh, but in the end, I think I managed. Uh, perhaps I missed one part. Uh, can you clarify where these peptides come from? How did you identify them? So basically the peptides, uh, would you like me to share the screen as well? Uh, uh, is it visible now? Yeah. Yeah. So basically, this is the 2D structures, uh, 2D representations of the sunflower trypsin inhibitors one. So this protein is, uh, this peptide is in a cyclic form found in the seeds of sunflower seeds. Yes, found in the sunflower seeds. So this is a wild type peptide. And then many study actually showed the, uh, we call it molecular grafting. So the replacements of these um, binding loops with the peptide sequence that we are interested in. So basically I just remove uh, this prime sites and also the non-prime site except, except these P3 residues with my uh, peptide sequence that I get it from the polyprotein sequence of the dengue polyproteins. So this is actually the sequence recognized by the dengue protease when it want to, wants to um, cleave the polyprotein into different components. All right, so uh, I take it and then put it here. Yeah, what you show here is a. Uh, so this is a, a cyclic peptide. Yes. So one end is connected to the other one with the peptide bond. So it forms a yes. cycle. All peptides are like this, cyclic peptide. Yes. Uh, okay. All right, so about the, uh, uh, the interactions with the protein, I think there's something wrong with that plot, as uh, Dr. Retika mentioned. I think you need to check. I, I suspect that there is something clogged. There is an artifact of the visualization software, I think. One final question to you. You showed us some uh, toxicity results, and you identified peptides to be non-toxic, right? Yes. Yeah, so my question here is, uh, what else do you expect? Because peptides are something always generated in our body. We get them in, in, in our food. Uh, basically, they contain naturally occurring amino acids. And uh, the motivation for peptide-based inhibitors is that they are not toxic. So do you think it makes sense to assess toxicity using these methods for these peptides? Or is there something I missed? Perhaps there are some peptides that are actually toxic to humans. What do you think about this? What's your opinion? 
Yeah, so basically, if you want to be completely sure whether the peptide is toxic or not, so we need to proceed with uh, the wet lab studies. But then for the simulation, uh, for the computational prediction, so I use this toxin pad mm. because it works for me. And then uh, I can use this ADME because uh, it's, it's more suitable for the small molecules and mine is peptides, that's why I didn't use that tool. And in terms of toxicity, it's very important to, to test because some of the uh, toxins are actually peptides such as the toxins from scorpions or so from a snake. So it makes sense to test what the toxicities um, of my cyclopeptides as well. All right, thank you. It was a good, good presentation, it had a good flow. Okay, yeah, thank let's thank uh, Tai again and uh, go to the next talk. Next one is uh, poster again. And the title is Discovery of Antibiotic Candidate for Extended Spectrum Beta Lactamase Using Multi-Target Resonance Machine Learning. That was an interesting title. Okay, let's see. Hello everyone, I'm Eri Pratyon Kloho from Gatsan Chemoprefection Research Center, Faculty of Pharmacy, Universitas Kisimaja, Indonesia. Here we would like to present my research, our research about discovery of multi-target antibiotic candidate for extended spectrum bacteria-lactamase resistant using machine learning. First, uh, about the background of our study, uh, at least 700,000 people die each year due to drug resistant disease. One of the causes of resistance is the expression of extended spectrum bacteriotomies or ESDL in bacteria. Venom antibiotics are the treatment of choice for infections that are caused by ESDL producing organisms. Unfortunately, uh, this Antibiotic uh, resistant also resistant to the new bacteria in this recently research. That's why we are trying to design a new antibiotic with multiple targets of for SBL. We use a bioinformatic approach that focuses on machine learning with random forest linear regression. This is methods that we use. Uh, we use three different tools, uh, Campbell, Nime, and Data Warrior. Campbell is utilized to retrieve data of potential target proteins and related compounds that have inhibitory activity towards those proteins. The potential target proteins uh, consist of beta lactamase and common target proteins of antibiotics. Data of those proteins are used to build ICPT prediction models with NIME software and data of compounds with ICPT below and nanomolar towards this protein were analyzed with data value. We use evolutionary computation here to find compounds that have the greatest similarity with a potent antibiotic for ESPR. We analyzed the similar compound with the prediction model we would before to obtain ICPT prediction. Uh, compound with a compound with lowest IC50 value was selected as potential compound to be developed as new multiple target antibiotic for ESPR. Uh, then about the results. Uh, first, uh, from this research, we saw seven beta lactamase from different organisms and variant as the target. To extend the mechanism of antibiotic, we also select, uh, select for target proteins that contribute to inhibition of DNA replication, inhibition of folate biosynthesis, inhibition of cell wall biosynthesis, inhibition of protein synthesis. Result number two, uh, chemical library. We try to find potential compounds to target those 11 proteins. The evolutionary computation yield a data set around 1,000 compounds with fitness criteria to cefidrol cell, uh, namely of uh, potent antibiotic uh, between 0.30 to 
to 0.6 T. Then result number three, we among this compound from the evolutionary library, we escape towards seven model, uh, towards 11 model we created before. And we found that uh, BX70, uh, the lower the compound with the lowest ICT uh, has the ICT around uh, 500 nanomolar, and it's three times lower compared to sepetiloxone. Uh, the result shows that PX70 are predicted to inhibit vector damage and multiple proteins that contribute to several mechanisms of bacterial growth, including the synthesis of cell wall, uh, protein synthesis, DNA synthesis, and blood synthesis. In conclusion, VX70 uh, showed its potency to be developed into multi target anti bacteria to treat ESBL. VX70 acts as vector of damage inhibitor and also targets for general target of antibiotics. With this multi targeting, we hope to combat and prevent resistance in antibiotic use. That's all from us. Thank you. Thank you very much for this nice talk. Okay, let's see, is there any question or comments? Shall we start with Attila Bey? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, interesting question, but uh, I have to uh, watch your um, presentation via my uh, iPad. So the screen is a little bit small. Therefore, I couldn't understand some of the pictures. So if you look at the methods, you're taking the Campbell database and then you have the, the two branches, one going via NAM, one via data, data warrior, uh, warrior, I'm sorry. So uh, what do you do with NAM exactly? You take out the beta lactamases or you, I, I didn't I catch that really. What are you doing with NAM? Can you explain? Uh, okay, okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes. yes. Okay, uh, we use KNIME to do the machine learning analysis. We create a model prediction with them and data warrior. Actually, we did uh, first from Campbell, we did till that in line. Yeah, I, I have problems understanding. So uh, what's the output of NIME? What do you take in and what comes out? That's okay, what I'm interested you. in. Are okay, the molecules okay. or proteins? Oh, sorry, can you repeat the last question? What's the output of NIME? Are that uh, molecules that you're interested in or are that proteins like the beta lactamases and different targets? I, I didn't quite catch that. Okay, okay. Uh, first, the reason why we choose NIME. Uh, actually, I'm a pharmacy student, so programming skill is not really good for me. We use NIME, it's the, they have benefit, like they don't really need to be have or to have some programming skill, they are codeless coding software. And then the output of NIME software is actually a model prediction. It could be the could be used as a model prediction. We test the our compound data set toward it, and we can retrieve a IC50 prediction. Okay, and that IC50 prediction that's based on what exactly? Like the similarity on other compounds, or uh, do you no, compare it with the binding site? Okay, okay. About uh, well, the ICVC, actually, we collect data from Campbell. The first thing, Campbell itself, it has like uh, perhaps uh, like target one beta lactamase, and it's all data set. I see all data set about compound, and it's uh, IC50. So we retrieve IC50 and its compound structure for Campbell. Okay, uh, can you shortly explain what I am seeing in figure two? Because I can't see the graph. I don't okay. see the axis and the titles. Okay, uh, first it's a uh, chemical library evolutionary. Uh, from the first result, uh, there are several targets and uh, from this, uh, from the targets, uh, we collect like compound that has or compound that has 
IC50 under 10 nanomolar, so it could be categorized as potent inhibitor. And then from all the targets compound, we make a chemical library uh, evolutionary uh, in data barrier from its compounds uh, from the, uh, from analysis of uh, potent inhibitor. We make evolutionary to cefidroxol. Cefidroxol is compound or antibiotic proven that they have white or strong uh, and as uh, inhibitor in currently research, uh, I mean, we make uh, evolution from the compound targets. Uh, I mean, compound in targets we chose before, and then we make evolutionary to cefidroxol. Okay, finally, uh, this BX17, that's a new compound, not uh, previously tested against beta lactamases. Is that correct? Oh, yes. Okay. Okay. And uh, does it, uh, did you check? So, if I understand correctly, this compound uh, has no reported activity. It's not uh, previously tested against beta lactamases. Okay. Is that correct? Actually, I did a uh, research about its similarity in Zing database and found um, this PX7 they has an salt, uh, natrium or sodium in its uh, ring, but in Zing database it doesn't have it. So I think this is new compound. But from the Zing database, we found that. Uh, there are similarity around 70, uh, 0 0.70, and it has activity against the telangiectasia. So uh, it's not really new, but uh, actually it's new because the salt, uh, salt ion. Okay. okay, let's move on. Honor, do you have any question for Eri? Uh, no, I don't have any. Thank you. Okay. Uh, with this talk, we completed this session. Thank you very much for everybody. Okay, giving nice talks and also the audiences listening to us. And it was a very great pleasure to be with you and chair this session. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Dr. Galaxy, for being an excellent chairman for our honorable judges, Professor Dr. Attila Kinir and Dr. Onur Sajnol for their questions. I would like to thank all of our others who put their efforts and all, uh, on this oral and post presentations and all our participants for being here with us. CBD and Trascode 2 presentations are over now. Big Data Analysis and BioTools and General Bioinformatics presentations are going on now. If you want, you can change your breakout room to join that. The participants are invited to attend our next parallel session. Then uh, we will have a keynote talk later in the day, later in the day by Dr. Yuvalitan at 4 p.m., which is going to be uh, according to Turkey standard time. See you there. Thank you all again. Okay. <clears throat> bye bye. Have a pleasant evening. Have a nice evening, everyone. Bye bye. Mm -hmm. Attila, I am leaving and I'm in the process of uh, assessing the posters, okay? Okay, do you hear me, by the way? Sorry? Uh, differentially methylated genes. We found differentially methylated genes. Uh, we conducted uh, regulomic, regulomic studies and uh, we focus on uh, TF target detection. TF means uh, transcription factor. And proteomics, uh, we conducted uh, proteomic studies. We constructed protein-protein uh, interaction networks. And finally, we uh, combine all these uh, 
studies in together and uh, create the context specific network. So our result is uh, we used uh, three different uh, transcriptomic data set and uh, an methylomic data set. Here you can see their accession number from uh, uh, GEO, NCBI GEO. Uh, so these are the numbers that uh, we detect in uh, those uh, those transcriptomic data sets, uh, differentially expressed genes. Uh, and here we can see the uh, here we can see we, that we detected in met, uh, methylomic uh, data set, differentially methylated genes, uh, 1,132 differentially methylated genes uh, we detected, and uh, 109, uh, 1,909 in, one, uh, in 1,909 CPG islands. And you can see we uh, consider p-value uh, lower than 0.1, and there is uh, another value for uh, differentially, methylate, uh, differentially methylated genes, namely uh, beta difference. Beta difference uh, measures the uh, methylation level of genes. Uh, we, we took that level uh, greater than 0.2 and you can see uh, the you can see the uh, distribution of differential methylated genes hyper uh, dmgs hippo dmgs and there is also uh, there are also uh, hybrid dmg dmgs uh, aka having uh, hyper and hippo methylated regions in a gene so uh, those are the those are our uh, results of WGCNA. You can see the uh, here that uh, some groups, some modules. Uh, this WGCNA uh, eventually uh, gives uh, gives you a, a modules that. Uh, uh, and that modules contains genes that are co-expressing, uh, namely, uh, meaning that these genes are uh, co-expressing in uh, certain uh, conditions. And you can see that uh, we found these results and uh, greater modules uh, accumulation. So uh, these are the results, result table of uh, WGCNA. And in regulomic studies, uh, we found uh, differentially methylated promoters, uh, that is uh, TSS200 and TSS1050, uh, uh, 1500. And then we uh, found differentially methylated uh, transcription factors uh, using trust database. And then uh, transcription factors binding to uh, differentially methylated promoters using trust. And uh, differentially methylated transcription factors targets uh, using uh, trust database. So here we can see the uh, numbers of uh, differentially methylated parameters, accordingly uh, hyperventilated or hypometylated, and their distribution of uh, either uh, whether they are non-coding or coding. We we, uh, we carry on with the coding genes. And here we can see the numbers of uh, differentially methylated TFs or uh, differentially methylated TF targets or TFs that uh, regulating uh, differentially methylated promoters. And then finally, uh, we uh, 
we constructed the PPI network, protein protein interaction network, and then uh, we integrated all this uh, TF data, uh, TF data, TF target data, and transcriptomic data, and we used as uh, uh, we visualized this network on a cytoscape prog program and uh, J active modules. Uh, App of the uh, Cytoscape program gave us uh, top top five highly transcribed network modules, and here you can see the uh, our network. In this network, uh, the shape that is triangle refers to uh, TFs. This uh, blue, uh, this uh, somehow, how can I say? Uh, purple or whatever uh, elliptic shapes uh, and these orange shapes uh, are differentially methylated genes and those that uh, those shape that coloring purple is uh, uh, TF targets So in conclusion, WGCNA results uh, show distinctive, distinctive groups of genes that are uh, co-expressed. And functional enrichment analysis of these uh, WGCNA uh, modules indicated strong relationship with uh, immune system regulation, that uh, meaning that uh, uh, co-expressing genes uh, are belong to immune system regulation and uh, at the end of the uh, context specific network uh, it revealed uh, seven genes seven novel genes that are uh, highly up or down regulating meaning up or down uh, transcribed via uh, epigenetic mechanisms uh, signal especially hyper hyper or uh, hypermethylation uh, genes that are differentially expressed and differentially methylated at the same time uh, meaning that uh, uh, that uh, context specific network gave us uh, are found to be strong re strongly related with immune dysregulation and uh, we uh, we propose that uh, further val validation of genes and uh, incorporating another omic levels will uh, broaden our understanding of ASS pathophysiology and uh, this will uh, eventually enable uh, for uh, better treatment methods and thank you for listening okay thank you very much um do we have any question for karen i may ask a question yeah the, your uh, candidate genes are make sense with respect to their biological pathways. And what about ERAP1, the expression pattern of ERAP1? Uh, actually, we haven't uh, any significant, we haven't found any significant, uh, significant difference in ERAP1. Uh, we, we haven't found, I can't okay. say. Neither, uh, neither in uh, metallomic studies or nor in uh, transcriptomic studies, we uh, we didn't find we, we didn't find any difference in era one. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. Apart Do from, have from this, hmm, apart from this data. Actually, I want to ask a question about era one. If do your patients have uh, increased BMIs? Uh, sorry, I couldn't understand your question. <laughs> yeah, apart from the uh, study, this study, but I just want to uh, 
Mm, I wonder that if your patients with AS have uh, increased BMI levels by the mass index, increased uh, uh, No, as far as I know, uh, the, they haven't any, uh, there is no evidence that uh, increased BMI or uh, in relation with uh, IREP1 or uh, in relation with uh, uh, developing uh, ankylosing spondylitis. Yeah, I haven't, uh, I haven't encountered it. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Do we have any other questions? There's a question in chat box. Um, ah, okay, uh, I just saw, I uh, missed, sorry. Uh, did you comparatively analyze the modules? Uh, we, we, we actually didn't uh, compare the modules of uh, WGCNA, uh, but uh, the, the uh, functional, uh, we did functional enrichment of uh, modules. Uh, but we, uh, we didn't compare it. Uh, we didn't compare it. We, we didn't compare them. Okay. Mm -hmm. Do we have any other questions? Okay, thank you, Kerem. I think we don't have any other questions. So uh, Sena had some technical issues, uh, the previous uh, presenter. So I think uh, she's now uh, available for any question. I think Onur Emre Hocam, uh, you had the question to her. If you don't forget the question. <laughs> Actually, I forget the question. What was the subject of? <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, let, let, let me ask a, a oh, general my... question. <laughs> uh, let me so, uh, ask a general question, Sena. Uh, hmm. Do you have uh, any um, uh, further research uh, proposal for your study? Uh, what's the next step? Sena, are you here? Uh, yes, I, I can hear you right now. Uh, yes, we are continuing the, our studies about the subject. Uh, we are trying to uh, model the same proteins uh, with, the, with changing the distance between the proteins and uh, elongate the simulation uh, to obtain more balanced data right now. Then uh, we continue with the, um, the ligand interaction studies and uh, we, we will look to ligand interaction uh, of the same uh, proteins to target. Um, um, you mean uh, computationally or experimentally? Uh, com computationally. Uh, we, study on uh, molecular dynamics uh, area, uh, but if we find uh, desirable uh, results, maybe we can continue with uh, in vitro studies also. Okay, but thank you. Team, uh... Okay, thank you very much. Hey, um... I, I also had a question about this. Mm -hmm. uh, did you consider to start with the doc, doc structure first, docking them together, and then start your simulations? Now yes, that maybe. you have some specific sites, I believe, uh, maybe mm -hmm. you can use them also. So I will... uh, we, we are considering the docking studies, yes, exactly. But uh, we first try to reach uh, more balanced results uh, with the different uh, uh, um, parameters, then uh, mm -hmm. we will continue with the docking uh, experiments. Uh, okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Sena. Uh, we have two more uh, presentations to go. Um, the one uh, before the last one is by Gazala Sultan and uh, Saliha Zubair. 
and the presentation is titled as Biomarker Identi Identification in Ductal Breast, uh, breast Carcinoma uh, Through Gene Clustering and Classification Using Machine Learning Techniques. Okay, let's continue. Greetings to everyone. This is Rosanna Kipan from the Department of Computer Science, Elite and Muslim University. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to present my work in Fifth International Symposium on Bioinformatics on Biomarker Identification in Ductal Breast Carcinoma Through Gene Clustering and Classification Using Machine Learning Techniques. Looking at the statistics, uh, Dr. Breast Carcinoma has continued to be one of the leading causes of morbidity and mortality among female population across the world. So therefore, Dr. Carcinoma is easy to become, Dr. Carcinoma becomes, becomes life threatening when it develops into invasive Dr. Carcinoma. And as the statistic says that 20 to 53 percent of women with ductal carcinoma is to have high risk of developing into with the increasing incidence rate. It becomes an urgent need for the identification of potential biomarkers at primary stage of cancer development. Several studies have been performed in this regard, yet it is assumed that some of the key markers which majorly contribute to the pathogenesis of cancer landscapes are remained unnoticed. Since machine learning has been contributing greatly to make biomedical science researches, including molecular subtypes, classifications, disease progression predictions, MRI image analytics. In this study, we have included normal breast tissues and with respect to the ductal carcinoma in situ and invasive ductal carcinoma in situ, ductal carcinoma samples to for the further analysis of gene, of gene expression comparison and identification. Since 3000 BC, the first documented case of tumor of the best are, were found and treated with fire drills. Over the time, various, various treatment methodologies, for example, mastectomy, mammogram, mammogram and uh, radium-based cancer treatments has been developed in, and in recent years. And the first clinical trials approved to test CRISPR-Cas19 gene editing methodology against breast cancer cells about tools and methodology. In this study, we have visualized five different data sets comprising of normal, normal samples, ductal carcinoma in zero samples, and invasive ductal carcinoma samples for the, for the gene expression analysis, where we have identified, where we have compared normal samples with the ductal carcinoma in samples and identified total 509 differential expressions genes. And when we compare the genes which are specific to the, which are specifically responsible for the development in ductal carcinoma in situ to invasive ductal carcinoma, we found that there are total 312 genes which were responsible in progression of the, which might be responsible in progression of the ductal carcinoma in situ to invasive ductal carcinoma. Furthermore, the common DEGs which work among both the, part, the common DEGs for 59, which were identified and followed by the gene regulatory network analysis and for functional enrichment analysis to identify their molecular involvement and biological functions in the breast, sam breast cancer samples. Additionally, we have applied the machine learning algorithms to analyze the genes, uh, to train the gene models, which can classify the genes based on their expression that these genes are which falls in the normal sample category and which falls in the disease sample category. So based on the gene expression levels, we have we have classified the genes in two different groups, normal and the disease. Disease group contains the disease and IDS group. Furthermore, we have uh, we classified the genes and applied seven different machine learning algorithms for the DEG validation because we have already identified the common DEGs. We had to, we had to cross validate the DEGs that we have we are identifying from gene expression analysis, and the common genes which were found were for, taken for gene regulatory network analysis and from the functional enrichment analysis. Uh, the common disease that we have identified has, has not been going through the network analysis and we have identified that genes are majorly interacting with each other. Most of the genes, as you can see, the network is 
साइड दें फाइनली द डोको एक्सप्रेशन एनालिसिस ऑफ द डेटा रिव्यू द 12 जीन्स आउट ऑफ 59 जीन्स वर को एक्सप्रेस विद विद वर हाईली को एक्सप्रेस विद इच अदर जीन्स इन्वॉल्व्ड इन टेस्ट कासिंग अकॉर्डिंग टू आर रिजल्ट दीस जीन्स आर एसोसिएटेड इन को एक्सप्रेशन विद अदर जीन्स एंड आल्सो एक्सप्रेस इन द ब्रेस्ट टिश्यूज इन फाइव क्लासिफाइडिफाइडिफाइडिफाइडिफाइडिफाइडिफाइडिफाइडिफाइडिफाइडिफाइडिफाइडिफाइडिफाइडिफाइडिफाइडिफाइडिफाइडिफाइडि
so this is quite a less number of samples i we understand but uh, whatever data set uh, data samples are available we uh, because we are doing only computational analysis we have no uh, facilities of uh, wet lab analysis so we are uh, accessing the publicly available data sets and uh, we are analyzing those data sets itself that's why we have mentioned that we we have to check these accuracy of the model of the algorithms on the large broader number of uh, samples Second is based on the any info on the subtypes of breast cancer. Uh, for the subtypes of breast cancer, we have take, we have taken two types of samples like invasive ductal carcinoma and uh, ductal carcinoma in situ, where we are focusing on the genes which are responsible for progression of in ductal carcinoma in C2 to invasive ductal carcinoma. So that's how we have targeted this study as of now. Uh, yeah, next is based on the DEG. Yes, the DEGs we have considered are low because we have uh, taken only the common genes, which are uh, which has already like classified uh, from uh, like which are specifically responsible for progression of the disease from carcinoma in situ, ductal carcinoma in situ to invasive. That's how we have, that was the initial aim of the study. And thus uh, also we have targeted on the algorithm, machine learning algorithms, which are classifying the genes correctly. So that's how we have concluded at the final stage, we have taken only 13 genes, which were taken as the target gene because those 13 genes were correctly classified from by the machine learning algorithms as well that which we got as j48 algorithms given uh, best accuracy uh, yeah Next. um uh, dr zanlu added another comment uh, i mean the molecular subtype uh, i think uh, about the subtypes of breast cancer uh, yeah, so in this study, we have focused on ductal carcinoma alone uh, because other subtypes include lobular carcinoma and uh, other types. Uh, so we have included only those uh, data sets which have uh, the ductal carcinoma and invasive ductal carcinoma samples. So I guess uh, no information for these subtypes. Uh, and another um, question is, uh, is it possible or is it uh, logical to ignore the possible differences between the two types of breast cancer and considering uh, as one group? Uh, I can add myself, uh, why did you get the intersection of differentially expressed genes? Um, I couldn't get that point exactly. Uh, what's the uh, biological assumption behind that? So taking the uh, intersection of two uh, differentially expressed gene group means uh, you are uh, searching for some common expression for, uh, patterns for two different uh, types. Um, I, I, can, I couldn't get that point exactly. Can you make any uh, further comments on it? So, so it is uh, like while doing machine learning analysis, so we have prepared the model which will be classifying, like we have taken it in two times, like first time it is normal, with uh, DCIS samples, ductal carcinoma in C2 samples alone. And then uh, the model will be uh, differentiating which uh, genes are like normally expressed and which are uh, like diseased form expressed. And then again, in the second go, we have taken the normal with IDC samples so that we can uh, classify the genes in different groups as normal and diseased one. Because when we are comparing D DCI as uh, diseased one, so diseased one samples are already in highly expressed. So their expression form is uh, large so that the model is uh, like not able to clearly uh, differentiate between the disease, two types of different disease samples. That's why we have classified into normal and then disease group. Um, okay, uh, do we have any other questions? I think that's all. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the presentation. Now we will proceed to the last presentation uh by Jemre Kefeli and Andres Aravena and their presentation is about novel targets of the VNT beta uh, catenin uh, pathway discovered using gene expression data mining uh, okay let's start hi my name is Jemre Kefeli 
and I am a master's student in Istanbul University of Molecular Biology and Genetics. Today I will talk to you about our quest of identifying novel targets in wind signaling pathway. Wind is an evolutionarily concerned pathway which controls development of the organism and it is associated with various types of cancer and Alzheimer's disease. In a normal cell that is not stimulated by a wind ligand, beta-catenin is degraded by the destruction complex. Beta-catenin levels kept low in stasol. When a wind signal is present, uh, the destruction complex is held and the beta-catenin accumulated in the stasol. The beta-catenins travel then to the nucleus to interact with the TCF left transcription factors. That leads to the transcriptional regulation of the wind target genes. Genes that possess a TCF left binding site in their promoters are called direct target 